So when we talk about science fiction spaceships, what's more important? Should they be realistic? Should they be cool? Should they be both? Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So a little change of pace today. I'm actually going to do like a tiered ranking system. I threw this out on Twitter and a lot of people responded to it. So we'll just see how it goes. And uh, if there's a good response, maybe I'll do one again in the future. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rank science fiction spaceships based on both how realistic they are and how cool they are. Now, you might be saying, well, you're an astrophysicist. Why wouldn't you just talk about how realistic they are? Because that discussion is going to get pretty boring pretty fast. We're just going to be talking about, oh, there's no such thing as artificial gravity and spaceships don't make U-turns. And one of the things about science fiction, and I've written about this in a post in the, in the description below, is one of the things that applies to science fiction is the rule of cool. The rule of cool is designed to say something can be implausible or unrealistic as long as it's cool enough that we're willing to suspend our sense of disbelief. And I talked about it in the post specifically about Star Wars, how many of the things in Star Wars don't make sense. I'm, and I'm not even talking about the prequels here. I'm talking about the original trilogy. Many of them are not scientifically accurate, but they are so cool and so amazing. And the movie goes into it so thoroughly and so unreservedly that you don't care. And so the rule of cool sort of overrides. And so that's one of the things I wanted to do with this list was not only to look at how realistic a spaceship is, but is it cool enough that I can ignore that part of my brain that says this is not a scientifically realistic ship? So a lot of people threw out suggestions. I have not thought too much about these. So you're going to get kind of a spontaneous reaction to this. I'll try to make it make sense. But uh, let's just dive in uh, and see how realistic these science fiction spaceships are. So my five categorizations of ships are going to be for the low highest one please abduct me i would love to fly on this ship the second highest is enjoy the ride i would pay money to fly on this ship and uh i think it's pretty realistic the third is not great not terrible from the chernobyl series that is there's things to like about it but it may have some uh things that don't make sense about it the fourth colony is fails at max q max q is the maximum pressure in a launch and when many rockets fail upon launch. So I wouldn't uh, get on this uh, thinking would do that. And the final category is blows up on the launch pad. This is for the worst ships in the category. And I'm just going to be selecting them randomly from the list that people uh, sent me. Lucky 13. That would be the Sulaco from the movie Aliens. Um, the Sulaco is the ship, of course, that the Colonial Marines take to the uh, LV-426 to wipe out the aliens. There's a lot to like about this ship. It does not look like an earthbound ship or like an airplane or anything like that. It looks like something that was built in space and that you would use in space. Like the other alien ship, which is also on my list, which I'll talk about in a bit, it doesn't actually land on the planet. It has landing craft that go down, which is a very realistic way of portraying things. Uh, it's armed with nuclear weapons, obviously. I say we take off and nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. The one thing that, oh, about the Alien franchise that has never been very clear to me is what, how the travel works between the stars. Because they are moving in real space, and we don't see anything about warp drives or faster-than-light travel, and it takes them years to get between planets... But if you're traveling less than the speed of light, it's going to take you decades to get between planets, not year, not you know years. It's not, that as part of the Alien franchise has never been clear to me. It's not a particularly amazing ship. It is very, uh, it's pretty good. So the Sulaco, I'm going to rate right in the middle. Not great, not terrible. All right, number eleven. That would be, oh, the Narada from the new series of Star Trek. I hate this ship. I hate it for several reasons. One, nothing about this ship makes sense. It's supposed to be a mining ship, but it doesn't have any facilities to mine. It can just drill into planets and apparently drop red matter into them and blow them up. A mining ship, but it's also extremely heavily armed and takes out the entire Starfleet in one uh, scene. I know I I've heard some people say, well, it comes from the future. Well, if you took miners from today and sent them back in the past against, say, the British Navy, they would not succeed like this. But moreover, I hate how it looks. One of the things that sort of crept into science fiction in the uh, early 2000s were these designs of spaceships that looked like insects or like just masses of garbage. It's because with CGI computers, you can generate all these funky little structures and all these little things sticking out of nowhere. 
But that makes no sense for a spaceship. Why would you do that? First of all, with a spaceship, you want to sort of maximize the interior space for the external surface. The external surface has to be built out of something very solid and very heavy to be able to withstand the pressure difference between the inside of the ship and the vacuum outside the ship. You don't want this ship that's like sticking all over and having to put all this armor on it to get the minimum exterior space. And think about this, if you're up in one of these little spines of the mining ship doing something and, oh, I need to go over here. Now you need to go all the way down the ship and all the way back up. This ship is just terrible. It's ugly. It makes no sense. It just sits around for decades and then pops up and destroys half the star fleet. This ship blows up on the launch pad. Number 10. Oh, I get to do another one of my least favorites. The SS Cyg USS Cygnus from the movie The Black Hole. This is another ship I do not like. It's not really a spaceship. It's a cathedral. As I said in my video on The Black Hole, The Black Hole is more of a horror movie. And so it has these big gothic areas with lots of empty space and huge cavernous hallways and the surface is all these glass panels like you're in a medieval cathedral or something like that. It looks nice, but as far as science goes, you would never build a ship this way. It also generates this ridiculous anti-gravitational field, which is one of the things I cited as a scientific error. Just an ugly, useless ship that is not realistic at all. That blows up on the launch pad. The, uh, I don't know if it has a name, but the ship from the 1986 movie Flight of the Navigator uh, if you haven't seen this movie, it's it's kind of fun in its way, kind of like a, a humorous version of E.T. In terms of realism, this is more into the fantasy realm. The ship is like shape shifts, it travels in time, it travels in space faster than light. It has this AI on board that is kind of obnoxious and eventually adopts the voice of Pee Wee Herman, of all things. I guess it's realistic. It does have this thing of time dilation where it takes a couple of years to take the boy they abduct to their star system and then bring him back. And because they're afraid of what time travel will do to humans, he just has to lose the intervening years. I mean, again, more fantasy than science fiction. There's nearly not a lot I can criticize because the science isn't really there. Um, and I did find the computer voice annoying once it became Pee Wee Herman. I, I'll probably rate it in the middle. Not great, not terrible. All right, the Agamemnon from Babylon 5. I have a, on this list the Leonov, which I'll talk about uh, when we get to it. And the uh, Agamemnon is kind of a copy of the Leonov from the uh, movie 2010. Lots to like about this ship. First of all, like many ships in science fiction military movies, it ha it's a carrier, so it carries small ship to go to other ships, um, doesn't have beaming or anything like that, or to go down to planets. I like it when they have just ships that work in space because landing on a planet involves a very different set of characteristics than you would need to travel between planets or between stars. It has uh, lasers, it fights in both directions. Uh, it has this rotating section to generate artificial gravity. One of the conceits of Babylon 5 is that humans have not developed artificial gravity, which I'll talk about when I get there. And so it has to have this rotating section. There are a few inconsistencies occasionally, like they have gravity on the ship, on the bridge, but the bridge seems to be in the part of the ship where you would not have uh, that spin and not have that gravity. But uh, overall, and I have another Babylon 5 ship on here. Babylon 5 actually did pretty well with how they designed ships. And so I'm going to rake this actually as enjoy the ride. I wouldn't mind uh, taking a, a, a tour on board the Agamemnon. Assuming Captain Sheridan's in charge, of course. Moving right along. What a coincidence. We have the Leonov. Leonov is, of course, from the movie 2010. It's the uh, Soviet-built ship that goes to retrieve the Discovery from orbit around Io. I really like the Leonov. It has, like the Agamemnon, it has that rotating section. It actually stops rotating that section when it needs to do things like maneuvers or grasp onto the Discovery. And then it has areas that are zero G and it respects that. It also does this really, really cool break, arrow braking maneuver. When they get to Jupiter, they're going very fast. So to slow down, they actually deploy these parachutes, these, these balloons around the ship and go into Jupiter's atmosphere and use the friction to slow down. It's a really great scene. Uh, one of the things I really like about the movie. I also really like the contrast between the sort of sleek, futuristic look of Discovery 1 and the kind of industrial grunge look of Leonov, which very much reflects the differences between the U.S. and Soviet space programs. Very realistic. I'm going to write, write that right next to the Agamemnon, since they are sister ships. Enjoy the ride. Ah, the Star Fury. The Star Fury is, of course, the main Earth Force fighter from Babylon 5. Lots and lots to like about this ship. First of all, it functions in both atmosphere and in space. Um, the Star Furies also engage in military tactics. When they're having space battles in Babylon 5, the Star Furies will go out and engage 
other small ships. They can attack capital ships by taking out vital systems, which is a very realistic way of portraying space battles. As they are moving, they can turn around and fire backwards while the momentum is carrying them forward, which is a really cool thing. Uh, NASA apparently really liked this design as a potential space vehicle and uh, asked Straczynski if they could uh, use the design. And he said, of course, as long as they call them Star Furies. I also like the pilots in the Star Furies are standing up because, again, Earth does not have artificial gravity. So having a seat is not really necessary. You can just stand up in the ship, which uh, I think is a nice, realistic touch. Uh, Star Fury, really great ship, really realistic. I'm going to put that up and enjoy the ride. The USS Enterprise. I can't say bad things about the Enterprise, can I? It's iconic. Um, USS Enterprise, actually, I mean, it was a groundbreaking ship. It didn't look like a plane. It didn't look like a flying saucer. It was something built in space. Of course, Star Trek has beaming to the surface, and then it has shuttles, so they don't need to land it on the surface of the planet, although they did in the, in the stupid Wrath of Khan remake. Um, I do worry a bit with those uh, engines sticking up on these thin things that that's going to create stresses that will break the ship. But there's not much to say about the ship that has not already been said. It's iconic. I don't see anything. I mean, other than the fast, the usual stuff with faster than light travel and so forth, there's nothing particularly unrealistic about it. And really, you can't downgrade a trailblazing ship like this. So we're going to rank that also as Enjoy the Ride. The Discovery One from the movie 2001. Not much to say about this that I didn't say about Leonov. This is an Arthur C. Clarke novel, and I've done a video on 2001. Discovery is a very realistic design. It has a massive engine on the back. Uh, the mass is central so that as the thrust goes on, you don't have the ship weaving from side to side. It has a centrifuge to generate artificial gravity. It has uh, the pods that go out to do other things. It has the antenna that points back to Earth. The only downside is that it does have a murderous computer on board. I'm going to rank that as Enjoy the Ride. And for those of you who know my Twitter avatar, the HAL 9000 computer is rather uh, uh, special to me, but I wouldn't really be on, want to be on a ship that he controlled. Oh, the TARDIS. I will probably do a episode about time travel at some point and the various theories about it. We don't have any proof that time travel exists. There are very good reasons to think that time travel not, it does not exist. The TARDIS is whatever technology, you know, the doctor's uh, civilization, Gallifrey, is so advanced that they have basic, basically can do whatever they want. Scientific realism? Not really. I mean, other than having maybe, uh, I think that in the future we will have computers that are uh, almost living. I guess that's realistic. But it's really com more, Doctor Who is more of a fantasy than science fiction. On the other hand, Doctor Who is my favorite all-time show. I love it. I have just to the left of me a whole bunch of books. I have uh, to the right of me a whole bunch of DVDs. Uh, I love this show. I love the TARDIS. I love the Doctor. If the TARDIS showed up in my yard, I would jump in right away. So please, Doctor, abduct me. The Serenity from Firefly. Serenity is another one of those iconic ships. It really looks kind of like a nothing, but I love this ship. I love that it continues that sort of tradition that started in Star Wars of having lived-in ships that have dirt and grease and broken parts and stuff like that, not the idealism that we saw in science fiction before then. I love that it's a home, that this ship takes many days to travel, weeks to travel between planets in a solar system, and doesn't have faster-than-light travel, I might add, uh, which is another very realistic thing. Um, and it has bedrooms, it has common areas, it has a kitchen, it has a dining room, it has the engine room. This is a ship that looks like actual people actually live on it. I love the Firefly series. I love that it's set in one solar system where you have lots and lots of planets and moons, and so you have plenty of opportunities for adventure. Serenity does have get some points knocked off for the artificial gravity. Artificial gravity is one of these things you use in science fiction because it's kind of tedious to always be having your actors on wires or CG or something like that, or to constantly be explaining that the ship is rotating. But Serenity even functions when the ship is completely powered off, as we saw in Out of Gas. So that gets knocked off points for that, but I love this ship. That goes right to the top. Please abduct me. <laughs> this one was suggested to me as a joke, but I'm going to go with it. Spaceball 1. Spaceball One is obviously not meant to be taken seriously as a ship. It's a it's a joke. It has one of the better opening gags in one of Mel Brooks' movies. Um, I will. This is a this is a fun movie. Obviously, you would not want to be on Spaceball One because the space balls themselves are not competent, and you're not going to suck the atmosphere out of a planet like that. I'll rate this fails at max Q because I don't have anything there. Obviously, not a realistic ship, 
But um, as a send up of science fiction, as a mockery of how science fiction works, Spaceballs is uh, is great. Like most good parodies, it's kind of a loving parody. The only science fiction parody that's even better is Galaxy Quest. Maybe I'll do that on the next time I do this. But yeah, that's a uh, you wouldn't want to get on Spaceball one. All right, this one's going to be a little painful. The next one that comes up is the Yamato or the Argo from uh, Space Battleship Yamato, or as it was known in the United States, Star Blazers. I love this series. This is one of my all-time favorite series. I loved this as a kid. 20, 30 years later as an adult, I got the DVDs, and it's still just amazing. If you have not seen this series, I highly recommend it. Space Battleship Yamato works in kind of fantasy land where you have faster-than-light ships and this wave motion gun that can destroy anything. Main problem with this ship, and this is a problem with that doesn't show up in many of the ships I've done so far, it has a very two-dimensional design. Because it's a resurrected battleship, it just has those armaments on top. And so you have this whole space underneath where if the Gamelons were attacking from underneath, they would be able to destroy the ship. It doesn't seem very realistic that a ship like that would be able to fight so effectively. This is an iconic ship, but I do have to deduct it a little bit for being uh, kind of unrealistic in the way it's portrayed. Uh, let's say, enjoy the ride. The Hermes from The Martian. I may do a video on The Martian. I love to talk about Mars, and The Martian is an extremely uh, good science fiction film, very realistic, and The Hermes is an example of the kind of realism it has. This is exactly what a Mars mission would look like. You have a ship that just goes between the planets, never lands on either one, that has capsules that go down or up to uh, prearranged uh, materials on the surface. Uh, there's a lot they do in the movie that's just wonderful with orbits and how they change their trajectories and so forth. And Hermes is exactly what you would want. It has a centrifuge to keep the pilots in shape. It has exercise rooms so they can stay in shape. It has zero gravity areas uh, for other functionality. The only problem with this picture in particular is the solar panels should be pointed at the sun, not in two different directions. This is a great ship. We'll say, please abduct me. I'd love to have this, have this ship on a trip to Mars. Uh, the Nostromo from Alien. Lots to like about this ship. Uh, the Nostromo is a, uh, is a basically a floating refinery that uh, scoops up ores from other planets and moves them back to Earth. It has a skeleton crew because it's mostly automated. I love the shape that it doesn't look like a spaceship. It looks like just a floating city in space because that's basically what it is. Um, there are some problems with the design. It's really got a lot of huge interior space that it doesn't need to have, which allows the alien to hide. I'm also not sure how the alien grows to such huge size without anything to eat. Landing craft again to go down to LV-426, again, very realistic. It's not one of my favorite ships. And again, that problem the alien, the alien universe has of not being clear on what the distances and technology are rears its head, I'll rank it right in the middle. Not great, not terrible. Battlestar Galactica, and I'm actually going to do both Battlestar Galacticas at the same time. Battlestar Galactica, of course, was one of my favorite series as a kid. I did like the uh, Renewed series. Very different in tone, but I, I like them both. I do like Galactica as a ship, that it has a very uh, large interior space that's kind of efficiently laid out that you can uh, house families on and so forth. It also has these exterior bays to launch uh, Viper spacecraft from. Um, nothing particularly great about them, nothing particularly bad about them. This is kind of the example of not great, not terrible. Nothing I see is, uh, that, that is unrealistic other than the faster than light travel and the artificial gravity, but nothing really drags them down. I'll rank them both as not great, not terrible. Number two, the Death Star. Oh, I'm going to get some hate for this one. I talked about the Death Star in my Star Wars video. Other than the artificial gravity and the you know, possible super weapon, the Death Star isn't that unrealistic, I guess. It also, you know, that sphere shape means you maximize the interior space for the external hull. So there's there's that going for it. The problem with the Death Star that I have is it's a completely stupid weapon. You could build thousands and thousands of starships for uh, the materials that go into building the Death Star. And yes, it can destroy a planet, so it has that terror use. But if there's 100 billion planets in the solar system, you're not going to be able to get to many of them. So it's... Uh, effectiveness as a weapon of terror is kind of limited. I actually think the best use they found for the Death Star was in the was in Return of the Jedi, where they used it mainly as a target to draw out the rebel fleet and uh, then use the main Imperial fleet to try to wipe it out. I'm actually going to rate this as fails at max Q. It always seems like a kind of risk of resources. I don't like doing that because it's kind of iconic, but as a spaceship, it kind of has always been a bit 
No. All right. Now, this one is kind of obscure. I was This was suggested to me by a reader from the extended Star Wars lore. And nobody probably watching this knows about this ship. I didn't know about it until I read about it. But once I saw that, I couldn't believe that this was an actual thing in a science fiction book in this case. And that is the Sun Crusher from the extended lore. The Sun Crusher is a ship in uh, some of the Star Wars novels that can, one, withstand a blast from the Death Star. I don't know how. The energy from the Death Star has got to go somewhere. But also is able to destroy stars. And it basically sends a bunch of energy into the core of the star and disrupts it and makes it unstable. And then the star becomes a supernova, even if it's a low mass star and destroys entire star systems. If you've watched my video on Addicted to Love, I talked about how stars die. And it's a very specific process that has to go through very specific stages. If you just disrupt the interior of a star, there's a lot going on in the interior of a star. The interior of a star can be tens of millions to billions of degrees. It's extremely dense. It, it's at extremely high pressure. You know, sending a few torpedoes, even if you disrupt it, you know, the stars are just going to shrug that off. Stars evolve on massive timescales. Even massive stars at the end of their lives take weeks and days to go through those final stages. So this is just a complete kind of insult uh, as, a, as a science fiction thing. I almost feel like they they were trolling me. So again, I know this one is obscure. Most of you had never heard of it. I had never heard of it. When someone alerted me to this, I was like, oh my God, they really did that? I had to include it in here just so I had a, one more thing to rant and rave about. Blows up on the launch pad, clearly. Uh, next one, the Eagle spacecraft from Space 1999. I like these ships for several reasons. One, the Space 1999 series was good. Two, when Space 1999 came out, they came out with these Space 1999 toys of the Eagle, and it was just a fantastic toy. It You could open it up. It had tools. It had spaceships. You could actually take off the command module and the engines and put them together to make a little scout ship. It was just one of the best toys I ever had as a kid. But in terms of science, of science fiction, I really like it as a vehicle on the moon. It's, uh, it's very similar to the space uh, hopper they have in the movie 2001, which is also very realistic. It just uses engines to get up and then just sort of coasts on that in the low gravity. Um, I really like that these things are uh, come up somewhat flexible. They can do different missions. You just reconfigure the central area uh, to have, uh, have it carry out different missions. It is kind of unrealistic that they are able, as uh, if I remember correctly, to land on planets and take off from planets. They don't have that kind of fuel. Tyranny of the Rocket Equation, you remember I talked about a few videos ago where you need a lot of fuel to get off from the ship, from the surface of a planet, so they would not be able to do that. But as far as a lunar vehicle goes, this is great. So we're going to say enjoy the ride. Final ship is the Millennium Falcon. Uh, the Millennium Falcon is, as far as spaceships go, not terribly realistic. It travels faster than light. It makes U-turns, that sort of thing. And as a cargo ship, there's been some debate online about it because it doesn't have a lot of interior space. So some people have said it's more like a smuggler, that it carries small but illicit cargo, which uh, Han hints at at several points. Another uh, theory is that it's actually a tug that tows larger uh, cargo vessels. Both of those seem fairly reasonable to me. I do like that it doesn't look like an airplane or an earthbound ship. It looks like something different. It looks like a spaceship. It has all these parts sticking out and it, it really exemplifies this what Lucas brought to science fiction, which is this sort of grungy, lived in, seat of your pants universe where not everything works all the time and not everything's clean and there's dirty underwear in the showers and stuff like that. And so I do uh, appreciate it for that. I knock it down for some of the unrealism of the Star Wars universe in general, but uh, I will raise it up for the sheer coolness factor to enjoy the ride. So looking over my list, I'm pretty happy with this list. Um, there are some I might move around by one category or another, but uh, I think I, I had a pretty diverse selection of things I could rant and rave about and things that I could uh, praise. A lot of you suggested ships. I wasn't able to get to all of them. I didn't want to make this video three hours long. So I may do another one of these in the future. If you there's a ship you would like me to talk about in review, put it in the comments and uh, I'll review it. The wonderful thing about science fiction is people tend to be imaginative. Um, sometimes a little too imaginative, as you can see with those, those ships at the bottom. But they, they tend to invest a little bit of thought, a little bit of reason into it. Sometimes in the case of like Babylon 5 or the 2001 uh, franchise, they actually invest some science into it. And so looking over this list tells me a little bit about how I respond to science fiction. Yes, I'm looking for things that are realistic, but I'm also looking for things 
that are thought out. You know, I'm looking for spaceships that have function. Spaceships that look like actual people use them. Actual people live in them. They have a design that fits the purpose for which they were built. The Star Fury, for example. The Leonov, for example. The Hermes, for example. The Eagle, for example. These are all ships that are designed for their purpose, for their mission. And you would design them a completely different way if you were trying to do another mission. They're not generic. They're not just designed to look cool or look stupid. They're designed with some kind of functionality in mind, and in many cases reflect something about the culture and the civilization that built them. A ship in a science fiction series sometimes becomes like a character. When the Enterprise was destroyed in Star Trek III, people said it was almost like a character had died. It was a very sad moment. When you look, when I look at the ships that I've ranked higher on this ship, they have that character. They have that feel of something that you grasp onto emotionally, that you feel is part of the show or the movie. This was a lot of fun, and I, I hope to do this again, not just with ships, but with other things. And I have a URL in the description below for this tier list if you want to uh, rank the ships uh, the way you see fit. Uh, I'll have another video for you in another few weeks, maybe just on science or something like that, since a lot of you liked the last one I did. Uh, in the meantime, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.